Okay, so uh, jumping back into the original PowerPoint, uh, I've been covering the opening of a second front, which is was given fairly short uh, amount of time on the original PowerPoint. Uh, but so I'm kind of coming back in the middle. There's a couple of slides there, but it will be hard to extract the arc, so we'll just jump through them. Okay, so let's get forward here. So. Uh, we were, you know, we've been working on C here for the last video or two. Uh, but here's this picture of, uh, again, I showed it to you earlier because uh, we're going back a slide of the big three, the big three, the big three, Roosevelt Church and Stalin at Tehran. Okay, and so since I've got this here in front of me, I want you to look at uh, Roosevelt. How he's looking? Looks pretty good there. Okay, all right. But uh, keep that in mind. We'll get to some stuff later. Okay. I, I told you, of course, the, we've looked at this map before. Uh, Stalin needs pressure taken off of the Soviet Union because of the, the war with Germany. Okay. Uh, so I've already explained the D-Day invasion, the invasion of Normandy. There's a few slides here, so I'll just I can stop and click for them real quick. Here's some of the landing craft I was talking about. These are bigger landing craft designed land trucks, small ones, you know, Higgins boats, land people. Uh, there's a couple more pictures here, you know, men going ashore on D-Day. Uh, here's the map I wished I'd had earlier, okay, so since we've got it here, we'll stop and look at it for just a second. Here's the Pas de Calais I was telling you about, the skinny part of the channel. That would be the logical place to land, but this is where we actually landed here, okay, and see so here's the port of Cherbourg, you can capture this port, gives you a place to uh, land supplies, okay, but then like I said, you have to break out and then pivot and head towards Germany, across France, okay, so all of this we've covered, okay, so something I didn't talk about, and since there's a slide here, I'll mention it, okay, in July, after uh, we landed in Normandy, uh, some of Hitler's generals have kind of had enough of him by this point. They think he's dragged him into this unwinnable situation. Uh, try to kill him. Okay. So there's a movie movie about this with Tom Cruise. It's called uh, Valkyrie. Okay. This was in July. I think it was July 20th, if I recall. Uh, oh yeah, there it is. It's actually on uh, the caption. Uh, Sadly, this attempt fails. First of all, it'd be nice if they'd done it in 1939 instead of 1944. Thank you very much. But it does fail. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this, you go, well, what's this got to do with U.S. history? A couple of things. One, Hitler already thinks he's smarter, knows more than a lot of his generals, and now some of his generals and staff have tried to kill him. Okay, and because he survives this, he very much starts thinking even more of it. You know, he's got some kind of destiny to fulfill, and he has even more suspicious of his generals. Okay? And there's this big purge, and lots of people are arrested and killed. And the important thing for our purposes is this pretty much ends any chance of getting some kind of negotiated settlement. See, the German officer corps, the people who participated in this, thought if they could kill Hitler, maybe they could negotiate something with the Allies. Now, Roosevelt had already called for unconditional surrender of Germany. He did this at Casablanca, which kind of surprised uh, Churchill, to be honest. But a lot of people felt that the trouble, one of the problems is the Germans weren't decisively beaten in, beaten in World War I. And this time we needed to make sure they got the message. So our policy is, you know, uh, unconditional surrender. But the German officer corps that were, and I'm not saying all the officers were in on this, but the ones who were, were hoping maybe they could negotiate something out with the Allies. Okay, uh, and I've already covered you know what's going on in France during this time period. The reason I jumped back into the slide at this point is to talk about the election of 1944. Yes, it's election year again. Gosh, they roll around every four years like clockwork. Now, Roosevelt's the first man to ever be elected president three times. Surely he wouldn't have the, the gall to run for a fourth term. But he does. He's thinking this is a bad time to try to change administrations in the middle of this war. He wants to see it through. I guess I can't blame him. He's been in for all of this. So he basically runs on a high, you know, I'm kind of busy fighting the war right now platform. 
don't really have a lot of time. He doesn't do a lot of campaigning. Okay? Uh, but his Republican opponent is a guy named Thomas Dewey, shown here. This picture always makes me think of Walt Disney because of the mustache, but it's not Walt Disney, it's Thomas Dewey. Okay? He's a Republican candidate in 1944. You'll hear more from him later, so it might be worth letting that name sink into your brain. Uh, now, Roosevelt does win re-election, okay, again. So he's the only man ever elected three times to be president, and now four times to be president. Okay? And he's still getting a pretty healthy 53% of a popular vote. Now, a lot of people maybe just think this is not the time to try to change administrations. Okay? And, of course, the election's in November. And so when I left you with the map, uh, I said that by you know, October... You know, September, October, November, we were kind of like knocking on the door to Germany. Hello, is anybody home, Mr. Hitler? Uh, and that the German resistance was stiffening and we were having supply issues because of the long distances needed to bring stuff in over out to the front. Okay, uh, And then so something's going to happen in December. Now the next thing on the PowerPoint here, it says E, Yalta Conference, 1945. Okay, But... And then it goes back to December. So this is very confusing because it's out of time timeline. So uh, ignore this right now. We'll come back to this. Okay. Let's talk about something that happens in December. So let's just ignore all that. On December 16th, we see the beginning of an offensive launched by the Germans. That becomes known as the Battle of the Bulge. Okay. It's December 16th. It's easy to remember because it's the same day as the Boston Tea Party. Well, geez, Mr. Ferguson, how do you expect us to remember that the Boston Tea Party was December 16th? Well, it's the same day as the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. Well, how could we remember that? Well, I'll tell you how I remember it. wrote a 104-page research paper on the Battle of the Bulge when I was in grad school. All right. So I will never forget December 16th, but it's okay if you do. I don't expect you to remember this date, all right? Uh, but I'll always remember it. All right. So what's going on with the Battle of the Bulge? Okay. Well, Hitler has been, you know, one of the things the Germans did excel at was reconstituting units, units that had taken heavy losses, reshuffling them, replacing them, reorganizing them, combining them, and putting them back into some kind of fighting form. Okay? And so Hitler's got this, this scheme. Okay? Uh, they'll attack through the Ardennes Forest, the impenetrable Ardennes Forest. Okay? Ardennes Forest, horrible place to launch an offensive. The forest is heavy. There's only a limited number of roads, uh, you know, narrow roads, forest roads. You're trying to put, you know, tanks down them. It's really not a very good place to launch an offensive. Okay? Because of this, it was seen as uh, a safer place to kind of thin out the troops. And so there are only four American divisions in the area of the Ardennes, which is in Belgium, by the way. Okay. Two units, two divisions that seen heavy combat had been sent to a quiet sector to kind of regain some strength and you know, kind of recover. And two brand new units that were very new. One was literally, 106th Infantry Division, was literally right off the boat, went straight to the Ardennes. Okay. Because this is, this is a calculated risk. Eisenhower doesn't have enough men to be strong everywhere, so he figures the Ardennes is a lousy place to launch an offensive, and so they have thinned out the line here. Now, there's just one problem. Of course, this is where the Germans had come through in 1940, so they actually have a history of attacking through the Ardennes. Okay? So here's Hitler's plan, okay? cooked up by him and, you know, of course, some of his underlings. Uh, we will take... The Germans want to take... Not one, not two, not three, but uh, actually like, is it three armies or four? No, it's three. Uh, three actual armies and punch them. Or maybe it is four. Jeez, I forgot. Let's see. 
14 months, one, two, three, four, yeah, four, four armies, four armies, punch them through this uh, area that's held by four American divisions, okay? Uh, we'll do this in December. We'll have a bad weather. We'll ground uh, American allied air support, okay? Thus, you know, taking away that asset that the Americans have, okay? Uh, and hit this area here, okay? Now, the plan is shown here in red, these red arrows here, okay? All right. That's the idea, to try to get to Antwerp. Antwerp is a major port that the British have recently captured. Uh, it's not operational yet, because the reasons I won't bother to go into, but eventually we hope to get Antwerp moving, okay? All right. And what Hitler wants to do is split the Allies apart, okay? The British are up here in this area, mostly, all right? And the Americans are down here in this area, mostly, all right? So this is a seam. It's a weak spot, okay? When, uh, you know, two different armies come together, uh, there's always a question of, well, who's patrolling that sector or, you know, who's in here or, you know, is, I, was, I thought that was your responsibility, okay? So the Germans hope to come hit the Americans in a weak spot, punch through, capture Antwerp, and then uh, hopefully the British Americans will start fighting upon them, among themselves politically, not militarily. But he's hoping maybe he can split the coalition. He see, it seems to Hitler, it seems like an unnatural coalition between the British and the Americans. Okay? So maybe if he can uh, set them a big setback, then they'll start pointing fingers at each other saying, whose fault is this? Okay? Uh, <clears throat> so this is a big roll of the dice. Hitler's going to put basically everything he's got left it's not on the Eastern Front fighting the Soviets, into this thing. Okay? It's a desperate roll of a dice. Okay? Uh, it's probably an overambitious plan, but no one ever accused Adolf Hitler of being a rational thinker. Okay? So on December 16th, uh, the Germans hit the Americans hard. Uh, forces fall back. Uh, a lot of them are overwhelmed. Uh, and the battle quickly turns into like this desperate attempt to uh, hold on to certain key crossroads, okay? Uh, because the road network is very limited, all right? Uh, hang on a second. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, so the German plan is to uh, you know get to that red line there, okay? Uh, Americans are holding on to key crossroads. They're blowing up bridges in the Germans' faces. Uh, they're doing everything they can to impede and slow down the offensive. Uh, the key to this is to hold the shoulders of the penetration. I mean, to, ah, why is my pen not working? You want to hold the shoulders and not let the, uh, the offensive spread out too far. It's okay to let it go deep, okay? But you don't want to get too wide. Because what's happening is any Germans who are getting out here are, uh, you know, kind of getting out where they're vulnerable, okay? Uh, American forces hold out at St. Viv for a while. Eventually they have to fade, fade back. Uh, hang on to Bastogne, which is a key crossroads network. And this thing, it's really dicey for about a, a week or two, okay? But uh, the Americans managed to, you know, keep the Germans from fulfilling their plan. The Germans actually, what they end up with is this orange line here, okay? That is as far as the offensive got, okay? Now, when I was doing that big, massive report, I was trying to figure out a way to wrap my head around this and see how big this is, this bulge, okay? This becomes known as the Battle of the Bulge. If this were Denton, and this is Fort Worth. And this is Dallas. That's a pretty good approximation of how big this bulge was. It's called a salient in the military. Uh, but eventually, uh, the weather clears, the American air power comes in, and we're able to stabilize the situation. And I have to stop because we're hitting at the time limit.